Uh, welcome everyone to another uh, evening of Stop BS Now English class. Uh, today we're discussing everyone's all time favorite, Animal Farm by George Orwell. Uh, we have with us uh, Sophia uh, from grade. Sophia, what can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm in grade eight. Okay. And uh, I go to Alan A. Martin Senior Public School. A little louder. Um, I also go to Alan A. Martin Senior Public School. Toronto, uh, Mississauga, Toronto, Canada. Yes. Yeah. Uh, not that it matters where we are anymore, or does it? Seems like it's all one world now, everyone in lockdown, unless you're in Africa or a village, but even it's changing for them. Derek, who are you? Uh, I, I'm in grade 10 and I go to Oakville Trafalgar High School uh, in, in Oakville. Right, uh, and you've Studied Animal Farm in school or with me? Uh, with you, but it was a long time ago. So. Okay. And uh, well, hopefully both of you uh, remember it quite well. Um, I'll give a, a little brief introduction and then hopefully you'll have some comments. Um, this text is normally uh, interpreted as if it were purely inspired by um, the disasters uh, in the Soviet Union, that the revolution, the communist revolution, uh, at least that's how Westerners living in uh, our capitalist world love to interpret this book. Uh, it's based on a few clues and it's also based on uh, conveniently ignoring plenty of other clues. Uh, the few clues might be uh, again, examples such as, oh, the, uh, the crow, what was his name? Moses being banned from Animal Farm. And uh, it's clear that he represents uh, religion and the communists did banish religious authorities from their society. Um, secondly, what other, what other uh, hints were there? Allusions to the communist revolution. Uh, goodness, I'm not sure. Uh, hopefully we can make it clear that uh, this book also applies to us or anyone living in the capitalist world. Uh, Derek and Sophia, any uh, comments? Any thoughts on where you'd like to start looking for parallels? With... Uh... Mm. Derek, feel free to interrupt. Uh, I guess we could start with the pigs. The pigs. And what would you like to say about the pigs? Uh, they become the new leaders and they foil and spoil the, the supposedly uh, or the revolution that was intended to bring a, a better world for the animals. What do you think about the pigs? Uh, I, I guess the pigs were pretty, oh, 
impressive to to the other animals. Like, um, uh, they almost controlled everything on the well. Uh, they did control everything on the farm. They did, uh, and so some people would say, "Well, that's communism. That's North Korea. That's China." Uh, why is that not fair? Uh, because it can also apply to capitalism and uh, the governments in yes. uh, countries that don't have a communist government. Right. Uh, for example, presently uh, we have a you know, virtual martial law, meaning uh, the military or uh, what's the word? The, the prime minister or presidents uh, are making executive orders for the entire country, uh, passing laws or uh, enforcing laws that never existed and that certainly infringe on our, uh, on our rights and freedoms. Uh, their excuses that we have a emergency situation. And so life doesn't seem so very different now here and from, uh, it, from life in on Animal Farm or in North Korea, I suppose. Uh, any thoughts on that? Um, In what way does Canada now start to look like an animal farm? Like, like you mean about the coronavirus? And yes, yes. Uh, on account of the the new rules and uh, are they laws yet? Who knows? Um, the new behaviors that are expected from us. How are we starting to resemble an animal farm? Uh, uh, I, I guess um, the majority of people are starting to obey the, uh, the government's or orders um, more. Yes, um, we're, are, well, we've always been very obedient. Are we ob obeying them more than before? They're just different rules now. Um, Sophia, any ideas? Uh, so, you know how the pigs kind of ruled animal farm uh, with like fear mongering tactics and that's how they got the other animals to obey them obediently. Yes, if you don't obey us, uh, Farmer Jones will come back, uh, Snowball might come back. Fear, go ahead. Uh, the media essentially makes coronavirus a lot of um, a very 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 big deal and we're being told to stay home schools also out uh because there's this fear of catching coronavirus yeah and we're also like if you're gonna travel you're uh there's also um if you come back from a, another country you're being asked to stay home for uh, like self isolate for 14 days. Right. Um, those were some good points. Um, self isolate. We can't even leave the country anymore. Uh, I think they'll be shutting down the borders soon. Uh, it's getting hard to go to the States. It's getting hard to go anywhere. Um, it's similarly, animals on a farm must stay on the farm. Um, they don't have permission to leave. They are the property of the farmer. Um, 
and the fear uh, the fear factor is uh, is critical um, in the case of an uh, animal farm was snowball actually a threat to the people to the other animals was farmer jones what's the word would he be worse than napoleon if he returned derek Uh, I, th I think Farmer Jones would probably be better than Napoleon as the, like, the leader of, of, of the farm because, um, I th think, uh, Na Napoleon was, was mostly, uh, taking charge, uh, for, for, for his own purposes or, um, to benefit himself only or or the pigs i think yeah. uh while uh farm farmer jones um well uh, well i guess it, it it is for his benefit also but like uh he would treat the animals more fairly i i i, I think you might be right uh <clears throat> i can uh agree for, with you for another reason uh Farmer Jones is an experienced farmer. He knows how to run the equipment. He knows how to manage the animals. Uh, he has experience. The pigs have no experience, uh, have no idea how to run a farm productively. Uh, not that it's impossible to learn how to do it, but uh, the fact that they get to control the farm without experience and skills might explain why the animals suffer so much so much more under the pigs than under farmer jones now that might that actually parallels what happened in uh, in communist china i think during the uh, the revolution there when a number of uh, government policies uh, basically ruined the agricultural sector and resulted in uh, starvation for millions. Um, so I don't know if that parallel is intentional. It's uh, certainly uh, a good one, I think. Um, how about this, the choice? Why did, uh, the choice to, or the decision to make the leaders pigs. Does, did Orwell choose wisely or, and why did he choose pigs? Do you think it's a good choice to have pigs represent your leaders? Sophia or Derek, Any, either of you. Mm. You could be, because uh, the way Napoleon ran the farm was uh, terrible for the animals. He, um, I'm not sure, but I'm just uh, thinking pigs, they usually aren't represented in a good way. Like people, like if you were to be uh, called a pig, you wouldn't take that as a compliment. So maybe he's calling the leaders pigs. Yes, he is. And it's the most- uh, Like they're lazy. That is the stereotype about pigs. Uh, they're lazy maybe. And secondly, what's the other quality commonly associated with pigs? Uh, they're- Dirty. Dirty. True. I mean, often parents, uh, North American parents might use that word to describe a dirty child. Um, anything else? 
gluttony or greed for food or greed in general. Um, are the pigs greedy in the novel? Yes. Yeah, what do they want? There's just a small note in the novel about what they're interested in and what they want to prevent others from having. Power? <laughs> that's definitely true, but that's, they never say that and the narrator never tells us that. Um, but the narrator does tell us that they want the milk. Why? Well, they, their excuse is they, they have to do all the heavy thinking. You know, brains do consume a lot of our uh, energy, far more than uh, you would expect them considering their size. Uh, I think it's, what is it, 30 or 40% of our energy gets um, used by our brains. Um, is it a good excuse for them? Do you think our leaders are thinking so much more than other people? These are supposed to be fun questions, so just have fun with them. Do you think, uh, Tron was it Toronto's mayor? Doug Ford, is it Doug or Rob Ford? I forgot. Um, Canada's prime minister, do they strike you as people who are uh, doing much more thinking than the average person? No. No, they don't seem exceptional and in any intellectual way. Um, so I suppose the question is, uh, why are they the leaders? Well, um, or perhaps the question is, uh, another question is, do you think our leaders, not only our political leaders, but the uh, corporate leaders who have the money that influences our political leaders, do they deserve to be called pigs? Isn't that just a bit rude? Uh, I, I, I think calling them pigs would be a bit extreme. But yes, it would. I, 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 I think if you disagree with uh, the leader of your country, then I, I guess um, you could oppose them or um, show, show, show that you dislike what they're do, um, what, what they do. Yes, criticize them politely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what is expected of Canadians, always to be polite. Um, Nevertheless, uh, what if we changed it to, instead of a metaphor, we said, uh, you're not pigs, you are like pigs. Is that better? Yes. Yeah, why not? Uh, and after all, it's, it, this is freedom of speech. Uh, I, it seems to me that freedom of speech uh, conflicts with uh, politically correct and polite language. Um, I don't think we should sacrifice our ability to speak in metaphors. Um, even if I were to call a person a pig, of course, uh, that would be deemed impolite, but uh, perhaps it's accurate, accurate in a metaphorical way. Um, and from another perspective, someone might argue, well, all the stereotypes we associate with pigs are 
stereotypes in the in a negative sense. That is, they're not really accurate. Uh, pigs are not lazy. Uh, pigs are one of the more intelligent creatures or, or domesticated creatures. Um, pigs are not dirty. Um, they do live in the dirt, but uh, they're not sick. And perhaps uh, we should also change our stereotype about dirt. Dirt is uh, part of this good planet. It's the it's the source of all life, really. Without it, no plant life, no plant life, no animal life. Uh, soil and or dirt, to use a negative term, uh, is critical to our survival, and it's full of life. Uh, I've even read that. Eating a little dirt can be uh, not only good for you, but can uh, can release some kind of happiness uh, chemicals. So all our stereotypes don't seem to make much sense. Um, and we can uh, say it's quite silly to call anyone a pig. We should probably just call them greedy. And we certainly live in a uh, world where our leaders are, are you still hearing me? Yeah. Oh, good, because uh, I got a little interruption from yes. Zoom. Um, if that would go away, I would be happy. Um, our leaders, our corporate and political leaders, uh, especially our corporate leaders, have enormous sums of money, far more than the average person. Uh, on the order of uh, millions and hundreds of thousands times more. Uh, you know, we have billionaires. Most of us will work a lifetime to earn a few million. Uh, some of us a lifetime to earn one million. So greediness is normal in a capitalist country. Um, after all, it's all about fighting for as much as you can get. Everyone wants a maximum amount of profit. It's never enough. That's greedy. Uh, and uh, if we can use Orwell's metaphor, that means we have pigs among us. Okay, maybe we should talk about some other uh, characters. Any suggestions? Not yet. What do we make of the windmill? What does the windmill represent? Not sure. I thought it represented a uh, Technology in general. Does that make any sense? Can we draw some parallels? The pigs uh, imagine that the windmill would liberate them from labor. Um, they are working harder than ever, it seems, harder than when Farmer Jones was with them, uh, in part because. He knew what he was doing, and uh, when he was there, there were also some other human workers using human or tools made for humans. So the farm work just became uh, more difficult for the four-legged ones. So the great windmill was supposed to do the grinding of the grain to help I'm assuming it's mostly for that purpose, to grind the grain that they're growing, to turn it into flour so that they presumably can bake bread. Um, isn't this a bit ridiculous? Um, I, I guess, yeah, because, um you're 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 putting uh, uh well no the the animals are putting 
a lot of effort to to build something that just requires a little bit of en energy to make like i i guess even the animals could make it themselves like probably you mean they could make flour themselves uh, um, i suppose they could by by hand or by hoof They don't need a big machine to do it for them. Uh, humans also made flour before they had mills. What do you think, Sophia? Uh, I think it's a little ridiculous because they idolize this windmill so much and it gets, um, I believe rebuilt twice. Yes. And they put all this effort into it. And do they end up building the windmill? Do they end up? Do they end up building the windmill? Because I don't think so. Because because in a way it's like, oh, wasted effort. I guess it was like. Um, go hope. It's like to make them work harder. Like work harder in a way, it's like a. Napoleon might have played like a mind game with the animals. Like if you work really hard and build this windmill, this uh this technology, this high technology you're gonna build is gonna help reduce your labor efforts. And I feel like even if they were to have built uh finished building the windmill, Napoleon probably would have used their labor somewhere else. Absolutely. In fact, yeah, in, in a way, the windmill became the new religion, the hope of the animals. Um, very much the way technology is nowadays. I have spoken to other students who, who really imagine that, you know, thanks to, uh, thanks to technology, life has become so much better than it was in the past. And uh, that might be true for a few people, but I dare you to try to argue that with uh, Canadian native people. I suspect they would uh, strongly disagree and um, insist that life was better uh, when they had virtually no technology. I think I mentioned that windmill uh, is represents a new religion, the new hope of the animals. Um, and plenty of parallels to that. Uh, what do you think, Derek, Sophia, isn't, uh, don't we have a kind of religion around technology nowadays? Yeah, like everybody uses some form of technology every day. Yes, but, uh, that's not quite the same as a, as a religion. I mean, don't people view religion as if it's a God, something that is constantly improving life, something that will save us, something we can trust and hope in? Derek, feel free. Uh, Well, I, I, I think some people in the workforce might, might think the opposite since technology is developing pretty quickly, um, which, which means that some people's jobs are going to get taken away. Um, oh, good, yes. They're not happy about that. Uh, yeah. So I was saying about uh, technology steal, stealing people's jobs. Uh, absolutely, those people are not in love with, overly in love with technology, at least not certain parts. Uh, I'm not sure if they generally look with suspicion on technology. Um, I have had students who uh, strongly believe that 
technology has improved the world and that uh, we'll, say, we'll fix everything with technology. Uh, it will s fix the uh, global warming problem with technology. We can stop coronavirus. Uh, we'll develop, I suppose, uh, vaccines um, of some sort. Some new sorts are now being developed. In any case, uh, everything can be fixed with technology. If we run out of bees, we'll make uh, robot bees. If the North Pole melts, well, we'll put some fans and pumps there or uh, air condition the whole planet. Who knows? Uh, that's how some people think. They're very detached from uh, nature, no longer in harmony with nature. They'd, uh, I think, be happy if we got rid of it entirely and we all turned into robots. Um, or what are they called? Uh, transhumanists. So, the windmill. Yes, it also has to be, as, as Sophia rightly pointed out, it has to be built twice. Um, and one more point, uh, maybe I'll, I'll make it in the form of a question. Uh, either of you can answer it. We live in Canada and uh, we still have a very important population of native people, the First Nations. How would they respond to the claim that uh, technology has made life better? What do you think? Uh, I, th I th think they would react pretty n negatively towards it because uh, they respect nature a lot. So, uh, if te technology would were were to become a very big thing, uh, then then they could potentially destroy their land or, um, yeah. Or, You're right. Um, and ha I don't think they would agree if with the with the premise that life has improved we have made progress um, i don't think they've experienced anything of that sort so okay let's move on to the uh, the fact that the the windmill was built twice uh, and destroyed twice uh, the novel was written shortly after world war ii perhaps even during the tail end of it uh, Germany had been destroyed during World War I. Uh, Germany was destroyed again in World War II. Uh, is this a uh, meaningful parallel? What, what does this mean? What is Animal Farm telling us about this uh, gigantic effort to rebuild Germany twice? Um. Do you get the sense that the novel uh, implies that it's wise to rebuild the windmill each time? Not exactly sure how, um, like how, how they directly connect to each other. Well, you, you were talking without me being there. Um, what were you saying about the, uh, the rebuilding of Germany and the rebuilding of the windmill, you're not sure how they connect? Uh, yeah. Right. Um, well, I think 
my impression is that uh, rebuilding the windmill each time is futile and foolish. Um, it's clear that, uh, not clear, but it's implied that Napoleon might be behind the destroying of the windmill. Um, how would he benefit from this? Why might Napoleon want this windmill destroyed repeatedly? Well, it, it ensures that none of the animals have time to uh, enjoy life and, heaven forbid, uh, think a little bit, um, reflect on life a little bit. Um, in the real world, of course, when things are destroyed, some people make profit from rebuilding it. Uh, some people make profit as they uh, foresee and plan these, these acts of destruction and uh, they can pull out their stocks. They can uh, get out of the stock market before the collapse. And then they can come back when the stocks are cheap and buy everything on the cheap. That's a well-known strategy. Um, from another perspective, I think George Orwell was warning us that uh, this will continue. Uh, cities, countries will continue being destroyed. And uh, if that's the world you want to live in, then that's your choice. But it doesn't seem very attractive. One more, one other point I wanted to make. Uh, oh, and by the way, this this rebuilding uh, of of society, almost almost of civilization, is a theme that was explored by uh, what's his name, uh, Ray Bradbury, in Fahrenheit four five one. Um, I wanted to go, go back to the function, the, the literal function of the windmill, to grind grain. Why is it foolish for animals to want or to think they need a machine that can grind grain? Yeah, a little silence is good. It gives people a chance to think. Do the animals know how to make bread? Is that a question or a statement? A question. Oh, uh, I think I think you're asking a good question. Uh, <clears throat> I think more importantly, or that question leads to this observation, uh, animals don't eat bread, don't need bread. They can chew grains with their very uh, well-adapted teeth. That is, maybe I should be more specific, not animals in general, but um, herbivores. They don't need a uh, windmill to grind a grain for them. They're, they're designed to chew food. If they were to stop chewing food and have uh, processed food, that might have some seriously negative uh, consequences. Uh, in fact, I've, I recently read a, uh, an article about the negative consequences of humans not chewing raw food regularly, especially in childhood. What that does to the shape of your skull what that does to uh, your jaw, the jaw muscles, uh, and that humans don't look the same as they used to anymore. Our, our heads have become longer, our, our jaws have become narrower, teeth more crowded because we're not chewing solid food when we're young. Everyone's eating soft foods, processed foods, uh, breads, uh, pastas, cooked foods, so we hardly need our jaws. Um, and maybe that brings me to the uh, to our final point. Uh, 
the animals on the farm are domesticated animals. What do you think would happen if we, if we put our cows, our goats, our sheep, our ponies and horses and pigs and dogs, what if we put them all loose, no longer took care of them, sent them out into the wild, say, take care of yourselves? What would happen to them? They wouldn't be able to survive for long. Yeah, what do you think, Derek? They'd probably be very confused and have no way to adapt to the environment. Yes, I think you're right. Uh, I think at the very least, animals need parents to introduce them to the proper behaviors for survival. Uh, these animals that we've raised, the animals on Animal Farm, have not had that education and well, although pigs pigs might survive there's some evidence or someone has uh, told me that pigs are quite able to survive but clearly uh, perhaps the majority of the dogs that we've bred uh, have zero survival skills uh, they are not suited in terms of their size, and never mind their uh, their training and education, uh, they just don't have the uh, the bodies that they used to have. So this brings me to I think the core point of the novel: uh, these domesticated animals can have as many revolutions as they want. What's they will never succeed because they need someone to take care of them. And that someone will always take advantage of them. Absolute power leads to absolute corruption. Do you agree? Does that make sense to you? Yes. Right. Um, the animals, if they wanted to succeed, if they wanted a better life, they should have just left the farm and uh, found ways to live in the wild again before they were, uh, what's the word, uh, forced and taught and trained to become obedient animals who depend on leaders to tell them what to do and depended on uh, a world that um, is very unnatural, grows food for them, processes the food for them, uh, keeps them busy doing this intensive labor rather than working with nature, which can grow the food for you uh, especially if um, you don't, what's the word, um, demand too much from it. And especially if you're eating uh, perennial food and not worried about, um, what's the word, planting and harvesting every year and storing your food every year. No, just survive on the food that grows out there and uh, life would be so much easier. Uh, maybe in another podcast we'll talk about that, uh, what humans can do to get off the farm. Uh, every country is like a farm now and personally I'd like to get off these farms and get on uh, quite a different kind of farm where I can be a gardener, um, be a wild man, uh, not be told what to do. Uh, as presently, I'm told to uh, stay in my barn, my stall, because there's some nasty uh, germ out there terrifying everyone. Um, being wild, being anarchists, 
th these are things we might discuss more later. Um, any final thoughts on this uh, amazing novel and the parallels we've been uh, drawing and elaborating on? And feel free to draw connections to our current situation. Lockdown, coronavirus. Um, yeah, go ahead, Sophia. We could um, draw it to the connection of like education. Okay, please, yeah, continue. Because uh, this one part that, um, there's one part in the story that kind of uh, stuck out to me. It was when the animals attended a school or like um, a camp similar to school where they learned the alphabet. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the end, the camp wasn't really helpful. They, the animals, many of the animals still couldn't uh, memorize more than six letters of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. And I was just uh, kind of thinking of how our education system is. Uh, yes, you also see plenty of students who are not learning much. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, and, and clearly this point is does not merely apply to uh, uh, the old Soviet Union. In fact, they had quite a efficient and relatively effective uh, education system. Um, but it's now painfully clear that uh, the American system especially is uh, not worth the money. Uh, not that it gets much funding. Um, there are American students who don't know where Iran and perhaps even China, they don't know how to find them on a map. Um, that's embarrassing considering how much comes from China and how much anger gets regularly directed at Iran. Uh, they probably don't know how to find Libya or Iraq, other countries that their government has uh, destroyed. So the education system is, is, you know, not to, I don't want to mince words here, is it's condemned by uh, Animal Farm, as it is in 1984. I'll discuss that uh, on Wednesday, perhaps with uh, anyone who's had a chance to read it. Derek, some thoughts on the education system or uh, domestication. I think the education system is actually a, uh, what's the word, a major contributor to our domestication. It doesn't teach us how to survive independently. It doesn't even teach you how to start your own business. It's teaching you to become good workers. Derek? Uh, uh, I th well, uh, I think the reason why most of the animals don't succeed uh, at lear learning the stuff they're taught is because like it it doesn't really ap apply to them. Like it's it's not really that useful considering they're animals. So and um, this this could connect to. Um, our ed education ed education system now, as like um, like the the way we learn can sometimes on only apply to a couple of people, 
like um, in my school, we usually just have a couple of power PowerPoints and then we would just re record the stuff off of that. So, so like it, it wouldn't really apply to kinesthetic learners or like... Uh, mm. Visual learners or sorry. Uh... Yeah. Like, I guess I'm trying to say that the education system does doesn't teach in a general way. And it doesn't teach you as knowledge and skills that seems uh, useful or practical. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's embarrassing that, uh, or it's to be shameful that. Uh, students don't learn about things like uh, basic things, vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, the difference between uh, the nutritional value of processed food and raw food, um, GMO crops. You know, these are things that uh, companies are making a lot of money from. These are things that make people sick. Students absolutely need to be learning this. Um, you will you will learn about World War II and World War One, but not about the Spanish Civil War and the the anarchists that were uh, crushed, brutally crushed in that uh, war that was intended to crush the anarchists, anarchists who were uh, people seeking to live in a world without rulers, without farmers, people who were dreaming about not being uh, farm animals anymore. So absolutely necessary to learn these. Uh, if we're gonna learn anything at school, we should learn those things. Uh, plenty of other things I can think of uh, are would empower students, help them uh, find their way through life, help them create a better world. But instead, you have to learn endless math that you will uh, almost never learn. Um, you will learn how to, uh, what's the big fad now? Every parent wants their child to learn robotics. Okay, you know, this is part of the push to um you know really make other human beings uh useless redundant jobless it doesn't seem like a a good ambition to become a creator of robots and ai when we already live in a world with uh rampant unemployment uh poverty and there's no guarantee absolutely none that once we have more robots and more AI, people will at all benefit from this. Uh, the, the wealthy class, the pigs, they will get richer, they will monopolize, and they might give the, the unemployed a, uh, what's it called? Universal basic income, you know, minimal survival uh, handout. But there's there's no uh, there's no honor in that. There's no honor in not taking care of yourself, um, and just re sitting down and receiving handouts and being treated like a farm animal. Right? You will still have to pay taxes if you have a job. Um, anyway, we could continue. I could continue on this line too long. The parallels. Um, are potentially infinite. But uh, let this be enough for today. Um, if you have any final thoughts, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll wrap it up in the next minute. Derek and Sophia? Uh, no. That's good for you. Okay, Derek? Uh, I don't really have anything else to say. Okay, well, thank you, Derek and Sophia, for contributing today. Uh, hopefully this has made uh, the novel more interesting and 
uh, maybe given you another perspective on uh, our world. I thank everyone for tuning in. And we hope to be back. I hope to be back with, uh, I'm not sure who, in a couple days, uh, probably covering 1984. Good night, everyone, and uh, don't be a farm animal. <laughs>